Okay. Um, let's. Sorry. Um, I want to start this webinar by acknowledging that we are here on the unceded territory of the Lillooet people and the Squamish people. And um, I feel so fortunate being able to work and live and play here and respect and commit and are committed to a deep consideration of the history, culture, stewardship and voice. Um, today we have some exciting speakers. Um, I am the host. My name is Luisa Brohenne. I'm the manager um, of environmental stewardship at the Reserve Municipality of Whistler. Um, we will have, um, oh, apologies. First of all, I go through the outline and then I will present the speaker. So the goal of this webinar is to provide the latest information about electric vehicles in BC, but also specifically in our cedars back communities. Um, we want you to understand the importance of adding electric vehicle infrastructure to multi-residential buildings, also known as MURBs or strata buildings. Um, we have received many questions um, thanks to um, your registrations. Um, so we'll do our very best and also the speakers will be, do their very best to answer your questions. We have received questions about the process. How would we go about adding EV charging to our strata or even starting an assessment? How do we start? And then what's the cost? What's, does it depend on how much charging I use or are there different models that there's one charger for everyone or does everyone need their own charger? So we had a lot of questions around how, and then also how would I talk with my strata and my property manager or strata council? And um, we'll talk about all of that, about safety. Is there a risk to fire starting in my garage or all other technical aspects in terms of electrical capacity, future proofing the building and so on. So we heard all of that and we're doing our very best to address um, that throughout the presentations. And again, I am happy to be your host tonight. Um, Luisa Borhenne, Manager of Environmental Stewardship at, um, in Whistler at the Resort Municipality of Whistler. Our speakers are Ian Pickett, the Manager of Sustainability and Climate Change of them from the District of Squamish. Then we have Kevin Fowler, um, the EV advisor at Plugin BC. We have Matt Hutchings, um, who is the president and co-founder of Clear Energy Solutions. Um, and lastly, we have Daryl Foster, Strata Advisor for the Cond Condominium Homeowners Association, also known as CHOA. We have a special guest, Michael Stanier, who is the program lead and communications at Plugin BC, who is very knowledgeable about everything related to um, electric vehicles and infrastructure. And he will support us answering your questions tonight. Um, we have a couple of polls. We really want to understand who is here and um, what your background is. So just for fun, I'll invite you um, to answer the first question, which is, do you already own or plan to own or buy an electric vehicle? Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, we have a lot of people answered already. 10 more seconds. Okay. And here we go. I think most people have answered. Let's see. So it's pretty fair share of everyone. Many people own an EV, but also many people think about switching to an EV and um, probably want to know what the charging infrastructure planning will look like. And some people are just here to know more. So our second poll tonight. Thank you so much for answering. Um, we'd like to know, have you started researching electric vehicle infrastructure already? We have waiting music. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Okay, 
I think most people have answered. I'm gonna close the poll and share the results. So yes, 58% have looked into charging infrastructure. Some haven't, 35% haven't started and some are not so sure if they're looking into this counts as research. Okay, thank you so much for answering. That really gives us an idea what to focus on. And with this, I would love to pass it on to um, Ian Pickett, the Manager of Sustainability and Climate Change at the District of Squamish. Great, thank you so much, Louisa. Would you mind going to the next yep. slide, please? All right, and to the next slide. Great. We are super excited that there's such a big crowd of people here to to be on online for this presentation. So yeah, really excited to to have this dialogue and hopefully provide a forum to help answer some questions. So firstly, a lot of you are probably intimately familiar with a lot of this information already, but it's worth going over quickly just a few reasons why EVs are so exciting and why most of us uh, believe they're the way of the future. So firstly, emissions. Uh, as you're probably aware, EVs do currently have higher embodied emissions or, or more emissions associated with their manufacturing, and that's because of the batteries. However, they do have far lower operational emissions, uh, particularly in BC, as we rely mostly on renewable energy. The graph on the right, just for comparison, the left bar shows the life cycle emissions of a gas vehicle. The middle bar shows an EV in Alberta, and the right bar shows an EV in British Columbia. Over the life cycle, which in this is assumed at 150,000 kilometers, EV emissions driven in British Columbia are about a quarter of that of a gas vehicle. So if you drive an EV in British Columbia, after about 30,000 kilometers, you make up for those higher embodied emissions and your emissions are lower from then on. Another thing that's really exciting about electric vehicles is they have much fewer moving parts and they require far less maintenance typically uh, and are much more likely to go further, which means that they're there to live longer and their overall emissions, life cycle emissions should be even lower. So if you're looking at a 400,000 kilometer life or even longer. Also, battery manufacturing is improving rapidly, as is battery uh, recycling and reconditioning. So these processes are all getting quickly more efficient, lowering emissions all the while. Um, EVs are about four times more efficient than a gas vehicle, as it's a simpler process that creates far less heat and noise as byproducts. So even if you were to use an electric vehicle powered only on coal electricity, it would have substantially less emissions. All of these technologies are rapidly improving. So ranges are increasing, charging speed is increasing. There are more ranges of electric vehicles and choices. And electric vehicles also lend themselves to very new technologies quite well, much better than internal combustion engines. So things like automation are much more likely to manifest themselves first in electric vehicles and later, if at all, in uh, gas vehicles. So for all of these reasons and many others, we are seeing rapid adoption of EVs in Southern British Columbia, and we are well moving well toward 100% of passenger vehicles sold being electric by 2030 in BC. Next slide, please. So the reason Louisa and I spend so much time thinking about this topic is that, oh, um, actually, yeah, this is good. Um, is that transportation emissions are a huge proportion of both Whistler and Squamish's community emissions. So in Whistler, 57% of the community's emissions are transportation and personal vehicles make up 52% of emissions. Next slide, please. Squamish is very similar, <clears throat> excuse me, with transportation making up 52% of community emissions. And this is mostly private vehicles. So over 50% of each community is related, our community emissions are related to transportation. This is where we really need to make progress to achieve our emissions reduction process targets. Next slide, please. So because of that, electrification is a big part of Whistler's climate action plan. Big move two 
is decarbonize passenger and commercial transportation. Whistler's goal is for a 50% emissions reduction by 2030, and this is compared to a 2010 baseline. Next slide, please. So Squamish is very similar. It's almost like we copied each other. Uh, we definitely learned a lot from each other's communities. Uh, electrification is a big part of Squamish's community climate action plan. Big move three being decarbonized transportation. So Squamish's goal is for a 45% emissions reduction by 2030 compared to a 2007 baseline. It's kind of interesting, a 50% reduction from a 2010 baseline is almost exactly the same as a 45% reduction from a 2007 baseline. So both Squamish and Whistler have very ambitious targets. And these are to put us in line with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's guidelines for limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Next slide, please. Whistler has a very ambitious specific EV strategy with a goal of 50% of vehicle kilometers driven by electric vehicles for 2030. So the strategy distinctly shows a need for charging, uh, for home charging for EVs. Next slide, please. Squamish similarly has a, has quite, uh, quite ambitious goals with a goal of 50% of vehicles being EVs by 2030. So again, only very small differences. Vehicles, uh, kilometers driven versus number of vehicles, it, it adds up to about the same. Squamish also has a strong priority for home charging as it is the cheapest and most convenient place for people to charge their vehicle. As you note from the first principle outlined on this page, it's really important for us all to remember that EVs are an extremely important part of the climate solution but they are a complement to, not a, not a replacement of active transportation and transit. We still should be walking whenever we can and riding our bikes and taking buses uh, as much as possible, hopefully electric buses. Um, we really can't abandon these other priorities for a lot of social, cultural, and uh, economic reasons. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of people in our society who are nowhere near able to purchase an electric vehicle, and we certainly can't move forward in a way that leaves them behind. Next slide, please. So finally, we have a fantastic new guide to EV charging that is now available on our websites. So uh, after this, it's, it should be a resource that will be very valuable to both communities and other communities. Uh, we encourage other governments to take this and learn from it as much as they can. Uh, just want to make a, a quick, huge thank you to Amber from Substrate Studios for her work on creating this guide very quickly. And Amber uh, received significant help from Diane uh, from Seed Strategy. So please have a look at this guide after the webinar. And at this point, I will hand it over to Kevin Fowler from Plugin BC. Thanks, Kevin. Great. Thank you, Ian. I'm just going to share my screen. Perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, so hey everyone, my name is Kevin. I am an EV advisor with Plugin BC, and I'm just gonna be talking to you a little bit about the rebates that are available to MERBs uh, within the province of BC, and discussing a little bit about um, the process and how to get those rebates sort of administered through your utility provider. So there are currently two rebate streams available to MERBs. Uh, one thing I did want to specify here is I understand there are a few representatives or individuals that are part of a townhome. Uh, unfortunately, these rebate streams do not apply to townhomes uh, at this moment. Um, there is some conversation happening between the, the province and BC Hydro regarding including townhomes within these rebate streams, but for now, um, townhomes would be able to apply for the single family home rebate um, if they wanted to install a charger um, within their units. So I just wanted to specify that. Uh, but regarding MERBs, uh, the two rebate uh, streams available is our EV Ready Plan and EV Ready Infrastructure Rebate or the multi-unit residential building charger rebate. And we'll sort of dive into a little bit about what these two routes look like. So the EV Ready Plan um, essentially outlines a strategy, uh, a design to 
have one charger available at each for each unit. So not every parking stall, but each unit. So if, if one unit had two parking stalls, it would just need to go in one. Having said that, you can do every single parking stall if that's what you desire. Um, EV ready plans, they future proof the building. Some of the facts that were mentioned um, at the start of uh, the webinar here that um, more and more EVs are on the road, you know, seems like it increases every day. Um, so charging infrastructure is going to be in demand in the future. So whether there may not be a, too many EV drivers within your building at the moment, in the future, there will certainly be a lot more in taking this proactive step in sort of future proofing your building um, sort of gets you ahead of the game. Um, additionally, having these uh, chargers within your building also increases uh, the value of the property as well. So and we'll talk about the rebate here for the EV Ready Plan. You are eligible for up to 75% of the cost to a maximum of $3,000 uh, for an EV Ready Plan. The plan is basically just the design or, or a blueprint, we can call it. Um, and you can only apply um, for one EV Ready Plan or you can only receive one rebate for, for one EV Ready Plan. Um, you do not need to get any sort of pre-approval or anything from your utility provider. You can just contact a certified electrician or engineering firm, and they'd be able to, to draw one up for you after they sort of visit your site and gather some data uh, regarding load capacity uh, and uh, having to look at your current electrical uh, infrastructure. Um, yeah, so it just talks about here sort of what's included, property details, your current sort of electrical capacity, um, sort of what your load has been over the past year. And then it's just kind of talking about some recommended solutions as far as how the design could look. And then of course the cost of actually going ahead with the scope of the work. So, um, so that takes us into the infrastructure rebate where you would, this is for the actual work, like the construction work, you're eligible for up to 50% of the cost of the electrical work. Uh, and up to about $600 per parking space. Uh, this rebate is capped at about, or not, uh, it's capped at 120,000 per MERB complex. Um, so that roughly is about 200 stalls that you'd be able to install within your um, building that would keep you within uh, under that, that $120,000 cap. Um, you do need pre-approval for the infrastructure um, in order to receive the rebate. So we'll just talk about here. You basically need to get the EV ready plan first. Once that's done, you'll submit that to your utility provider. They will then approve it. Once that's approved, you can then get pre-approval for the infrastructure. So there is a little bit of work that you need to do with sort of um, communicating with your utility provider and sending in some documents. Um, but this is just so that the utility provider is making sure that, you know, you're sort of following the necessary steps and things have been considered to, to make sure that, um, you know, the, the future of, you know, additional electricity is, is managed properly. Um, so there is also rebates available for the chargers themselves. Everything I've talked about has excluded the charger itself at the moment. Um, so if your building participated in the EV ready stream, you're eligible for up to 50% of uh, the cost of the purchase and the installation of the charger uh, to a maximum of $1,400 per charger. And that rebate is capped at $14,000. Um, if you did not participate in the EV Ready um, stream, so if you went the standalone charger route, that's this, the other stream that I mentioned a bit earlier, you'd be eligible for up to 50% of the cost for the installation and purchase of that charger to a maximum of $2,000 per charger, still capped at $14,000. So there's an extra $600 in there and that just adds a little bit of extra funds for sort of the, the infrastructure and construction pieces. Um, so anyways, when this is all combined, if you do choose the EV ready route, which is the route that we certainly recommend, uh, the total rebates available to you, including the charge 
would be a, close to $130,000 um, available to you. So certainly a good time uh, to go and consider getting chargers installed within your building. Um, these rebates are while funds last. So there could be a time in the future as more and more vehicles are on the road and as charging infrastructure becomes more in demand, it's possible that these rebates may not exist uh, in the future. So just wanted to mention that. Um, there are also top-ups that are offered through your municipality and some of those municipalities being Squamish and Whistler right now, they are top up to, uh, instead of 50%, 75% of the purchase and installation costs. Um, so that's a nice extra incentive for anyone within those municipalities to sort of take advantage of these opportunities. Um, just to touch on the chargers, there is a um, eligibility criteria for the chargers. So they must be purchased and they must be new. Um, they also need to be a level two that plug into a two, 208 volt or 220 volts. Um, so there is a difference between level one and level two charger. For those that do have a, an EV at the moment, the level one charger is the cable that came with the car that plugs into your standard wall outlet. The level two is why you need this, this construction work to come in and provide a higher voltage receptacle. So the other thing um, to mention is the chargers do need to be networked. Um, and this is an important thing to consider when you have multiple uh, vehicles charging at once so that they can sort of essentially communicate with one another uh, to make sure that, you know, the, the system isn't being overloaded. So it's a bit of a, a process to get it, um, your rebates issued, but you first need to make sure you're eligible for it. There's some eligibility requirements. The building must be located in BC. Um, this, these rebates are for retrofits only. So unfortunately, new builds uh, are ineligible. Uh, any and a new build is classified as any building that was completed after August 31st, 2021. Unfortunately, those buildings are ineligible for the rebates. Uh, make sure you get your required documents as far as the EV ready plan design, apply for pre-approval, and then you can submit your application for the rebates. So, uh, one of the first steps to starting this process is having a technical assessment done on your property. So that would be contacting a certified electrician to come out basically or an engineering firm and sort of inspect your building the infrastructure um, have a look at the current capacity load management over the past year or longer um, and they will have, they'll be able to help answer some technical questions with, as far as infrastructure and and sort of electrical upgrading so so that's it for my presentation um, if you do have any questions on the rebates and just sort of a bit more information about the process of having uh, chargers installed within your building. Feel free to contact us. We um, have a service where we just provide advice uh, through that email there. You'll be able to talk to myself or one of my colleagues and we can certainly assist you if you have any questions and provide information on how to go about this process. Um, so thank you for your time and I will pass it over to Matt. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming this evening. And um, thank you, uh, Kevin, for that. That was a great uh, lead in. I will uh, just share my screen here. Um, okay, so I'm just going to touch on a, a few points. There will be a little bit of crossover here uh, in terms of what uh, Kevin just covered. I can say from um, uh, from a, an electrical uh, contracting uh, perspective and and design um, and implementation perspective, we were definitely seeing uh, many many more MERBs um, trying to understand what the process looks like. More um, <clears throat> uh, more owners asking you know questions on how. Uh, they can get EV charging um, into their uh, into their uh, properties. 
uh, and definitely seeing, um, you know, people picking and choosing, you know, if there's a, if there's a, a MERB there that has EV infrastructure in place or a plan for it, uh, they're likely to, uh, you know, want to buy or rent there, whatever the case may be, uh, rather than um, uh, a location that doesn't have that. So it's really starting to impact the value of, of homes and uh, communities. Um, and, you know, this is going to continue to um, rocket up as uh, we, you know, rapidly approach uh, $2.50 a litre. So this uh, definitely uh, does um, uh, appear to be the future. Um, can't really stress enough the importance um, for the strata to uh, help uh, itself by educating itself and being proactive in terms of um, understanding itself, its own laws and bylaws, and how it can move forward um, in adopting these uh, strategies. Really critical, especially uh, in this day and age where, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, delays, uh, you know, supply chain issues, um, even, even getting into design, if you need to do some electrical uh, infrastructure upgrades, uh, the design process for that can take up to six months to a year and a half. So the more that a MERB and a strata can do now on the front end will allow you to be nimble for when an incentive uh, program becomes available and goes live, as Kevin had touched on. Uh, they do come and go. Um, so you don't, uh, you know, you don't want to see a great incentive come along and go, oh, we better get, you know, we better get going. And then the process takes uh, such a period that by the time you're ready to go, that incentive is gone. It's, it's, it's hard to imagine as we're looking to reach our, our uh, emissions reductions goals that, uh, that the incentives are just going to completely disappear in a few years. But um, as we can all agree, uh, changing times. So if you really want to move forward, uh, now's a good time to get yourselves organized and, um, and look to the future. Um, we certainly do recommend uh, a focus on level two charging. Uh, there are various degrees of uh, capacity in that, the level two uh, framework. Uh, generally speaking, in most MERB applications, the uh, overall best use of power versus um, uh, charge recovery times is about a 40 amp circuit, which depending on the voltage configurations is anywhere from six to seven uh, plus kilowatts. Um, with, within that window, 90% of the time, there are other factors that, uh, that impact that, 90% um, of the time, uh, all owners will, will have uh, good access to the available energy and uh, see a good recovery time on, on their charging. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I have a few points here where, you know, it's, it's really just about helping stratas uh, look at themselves and their own bylaws uh, to, to, to get everything lined up. So I'll just won't touch too much on that. Um, one area that is becoming more and more prevalent from um, an in inspections and regulations point of view is having stratas uh, provide letters of authorization for um, either moving forward with an EV ready plan or uh, in situations where not everyone in the strata is prepared to commit to uh, a full uh, EV mobilization plan. But, they're, but they are willing to allow other members um, move forward with uh, their own charging needs, whether they're paying for it or however you organize yourselves that way is a, is a different subject. Um, but hopefully in, in most situations, um, people will be able to find a way to allow who, those who want to move forward, move forward. I will touch on that um, uh, in, in section three here as we move down and elaborate on that a little bit more because it, it is becoming a very critical factor uh, moving forward. <clears throat> Again, uh, step two here is just um, uh, again familiarizing yourselves, um, looking at um, uh, you know collecting uh, different information. So in in this section, the importance of this uh, in this section. 
uh, is to be ready to engage uh, in an EV plan with uh, an electrical contractor or an engineering firm. Again, looking at timing. So, you know, you do, you definitely want to understand, you know, are you, are you having AGMs every six months? Uh, if so, in order to move quickly and, and have a plan in place, um, <clears throat> you want to be able to engage somebody and understand pretty quickly how, how, you know, how they're going to be able to respond so that you can get everything in line for that meeting and then you can get to the next, to the next process. This is, of course, assuming that you already have a, a, an understood high level of uh, interest in adoption and hopefully you're already past the or critical mark in 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 what you need to 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 like your the majority um, in order to be able to move forward with a with a with a plan. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things uh, just to to, to note, um, you know, generally speaking, um, it, it's more cost effective to move in a in a in a larger group format than it is to do uh, one off installations uh, over over time. Um, and then for those who in certain strata situations who aren't quite ready to adopt uh, um, a full EV ready plan, uh, as mentioned before by Kevin, these systems in order to protect and maintain the integrity of the uh, electrical uh, existing electrical infrastructure, they do need to be uh, networked and communicate with each other uh, through typically uh, an electric vehicle energy management system. So in order to do that, there's a number of different ways to achieve that. But one of them, for example, um, is with uh, a cellular signal, um, a cellular signal system. So for those who aren't, you know, they're just not really quite ready for an EV yet. But you know, you go three or four stories down into the parkade, and there's no cellular signal. Um, you know, they might want, they might have interest. In, in, in saying, well, I, I, you know, I see the value in, in having a cellular signal in case of an emergency or whatever the case uh, um, may be. So there are certain aspects of these systems that, that can have a positive impact on, on all strata members, uh, regardless of uh, it, whether or not they're looking to move forward with a, with a full uh, EV ready plan and strategy. So, um, so step three here is really, I would say, where we jump in as electrical contractors and uh, electrical engineers. Of course, I'll throw out the caveat um, that not everyone has uh, experience in, in these new technologies and, and these types of installations. So you really do wanna do your background checks and just make sure that whoever you're dealing with and, talk and speaking to uh, understands uh, you know, really what it's all about and, and how to make sure that they can uh, protect the interests of, uh, of the strata moving forward. Um, so I'm going to just, uh, jump down to, um, you know, you'll, you'll want to, you know, collect all any kind of drawings that you have. Sometimes in older buildings, you don't have, uh, you know, uh, architectural or electrical, uh, drawings for the building. Sometimes you can access through those through your, your local government. Sometimes the building is just so old that it's just, it's, it's kind of lost to time. But again, as much as you can collect. Uh, prior to engagement um, will help speed things along, um, you know, uh, looking down the road. Now here um, with letters of authorization. So what's really important here is that everybody in the strata understands what the implications are when individual users uh, are given the go ahead to move if the strata is not ready to adopt a full uh, EV strategy and implementation. So there, there's many situations where it's a newer building and they have really solid uh, electric vehicle uh, infrastructure, dedicated panels and systems of, of, of quite a robust size. Uh, but when you get into the, you know, 150 to 300 uh, parking stall range, even those really uh, robust electrical systems can very quickly become overburdened. and to someone who isn't totally familiar with um, uh, the the different levels in EV charging, they'll say, "Oh, well, you know, my Strata or the or the developer put in an EV um, uh, outlet in my stall, so they think that they have EV um, EV charging ca capacity in their stall, but really it's maybe like a level one or a, a very low level two uh, capability." And for those who want the early adoption, they can 
they can jump into that system and there's plenty of capacity at that time. But by the time 10 people, 20 people, 30 people do it, depending on the EV strategy and the rules uh, that the um, strata lays out is in terms of what charger you can put in, what kind of capacity for the charger that you can put in, those early adopters can end up effectively uh, consuming the larger majority of that available capacity. And then when those who come in afterwards, that capacity may no longer exist, even though all along they've thought that I have a stall with, with, um, with EV charging in it. So really, really critical that Estrada lays out, uh, you know, a plan to say, for example, um, Joan buys a Tesla and the rest of the strata isn't quite ready to uh, move forward with a full plan. That means a communication system, an energy management system, and everybody buying uh, uh, chargers potentially, or the infrastructure as the case may be. And Joan wants to put in uh, a Tesla fast charger, and this can charge at 80 amps. So if we're focusing in on a level two at a four, on a 40 amp circuit to give everyone uh, a, a good chance at accessing that energy when more people adopt, that one person now has a system that takes up double the capacity of anyone else. So from a Stratus perspective, you might want to say, well, we don't want to stop you from doing it. But we're going to we're going to put a law, a, a bylaw in here saying that if you are not going to move along with, say, a, a, a single proprietary system um, <clears throat> where we're going to be able to integrate that into an energy management system at a later date, then as more adopters come on, you may have to give up your charger. Um, and, and, and then and then come into the fold with everyone else so that everybody gets a, share, a fair share of it when that time comes. And then, of course, there's, you know, having uh, personal property, i.e. that your charger located in, in communal property, who's responsible for maintenance, how are you covering off, who pays for uh, the energy, um, and, and those kinds of things. So that, that, that is a really critical piece, and, and, and many districts and municipalities and cities right now are insisting upon letters of authorization from the st strata saying that we are allowing these people to, to, to move forward with this plan or, or we're doing an EV ready plan so that, that they can, they can um, be assured that everyone in the strata understands what's happening to that electrical capacity uh, moving forward in that format. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, once, once uh, you know, all the paperwork is done and uh, an EV ready plan is, is getting developed, then it's really, it's time to just move into uh, hiring a, a, a competent team that can deliver typically through a multiple bidding uh, process. And, um, and then, you know, once that happens, you just want to, you, you know, you want to develop so, uh, solid work plans, look at work periods uh, so that while that work is happening, everybody can continue on in their daily lives. Uh, moving on to, one of the last pieces I'll touch on uh, are some of the common challenges and considerations. So not all areas are uh, available for say communal charging. So maybe you have a, a, an electrical system that's kind of limited and you wanna go with communal chargers. So you, you, you put these somewhere where everyone can access them and then either through an app or a, a community group you can monitor who can charge when and for how long. You can set your own billing rates uh, to recover costs. There's all kinds of different ways that you can configure it. Um, so you don't always have to go with an individual owner having uh, their own setup or a full adoption plan. You could go with a, with a communal charging concept. <clears throat> of course, this is all generally speaking, uh, it's gonna be networked. Uh, there'll be uh, whoever your, your provider is will, will probably know if the station is broken before a user does and get an alert, get it repaired quickly. So there's, uh, you know, minimizing uh, downtime. Um, <clears throat> Just a heads up, Matt, that we are about at time and we want to make sure we have time for questions. Absolutely. Too. If you can wrap well, it will, up. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I will, I'll, I'll move on from here. Uh, just keep in mind uh, emerging technologies, they don't always have all the certifications and they're not always necessarily proven. So be aware of that. And uh, thank you very much.
All right. I guess that's on to me now. Yeah, and Daryl, just we had a lot of activity in the Q&A around Stratas, and I know we have time and opportunity for questions after, but just if you can touch to like who's eligible for the rebates, what's a MERP and versus a condo versus a townhome, there was mm -hmm. a bit of um, uh, a lot of questions around that, if you wouldn't mind touching on that. Thank you. Yeah, no, speaking to that idea that townhomes aren't considered MERBs and uh, yeah, that may be actually the case. I haven't actually heard of that, but from a technical point of view, when we look at a strata lot itself, you can have a townhouse that has a, a garage area that could be limited common property. It could be common property, and it could also be part of the strata lot. And that may be the challenge for the people that are handing out these rebates is determining really who's responsible for these areas and who has the right to make decisions on them. So um, I think that might be what's happening. Um, but Again, that's new to me. Um, the idea here is we, MERB is a multi-unit residential building, right? So it is uh, usually your typical strata. It's a, it's a building that has multiple floors with multiple unit owners, and it has parking and garage space and all the things we typically think of a strata. Now, there's many different types of stratas. There's stratas that are residential commercial and things like that. So these are all things that you need to consider um, You know, when you're when you're looking into actually beginning this process is what are we, what do we own, what do we have, what's our responsibilities. And so that's kind of what we're going to touch on in the slides here. Um, I don't see, I, I saw one about condo insurance and I'd be happy to have a quick discussion on that one. Um, honestly, when we're looking at chargers and insurance and fire, there's going to be some impact, but um, you know, when you think about all the gasoline that's stored in your parkade right now and the amount of fuel and energy that could be released, I don't think that the electrical vehicles are really that much different um, and actually probably are a little bit safer in a way. Um, <clears throat> you remember the old Pinto, right? They used to blow up all the time when you hit them in the bumper. So, um, you know, you do, do have to really just check in with your insurers if that's going to be a problem in the future. And, and I haven't heard anything about that yet. So let's just move on, if we could, to the slides. Um, so hopefully everyone can see those. Again, Daryl Foster from the Condominium Homeowners Association. So um, I'm going to, ah, there we go. So uh, again, we uh, Matt was great. He touched on that. Um, so building electrification, you do have, so if you're doing the whole electrification, just like we talked about, so I don't want to touch too much on that. Um, you know, you've got this uh, program that you can go through the rebate program doing the EV ready plan, um, but doing the building electrification is a one solution kind of deal. Um, it has a long term effect on on the value of your property, you know, the I know that there's people that we've been at these meetings where we talked where um, they wanted to be the first building on the block to have this done because it made them more attractive uh, to do so for for purchasing for owners coming in, especially younger buyers and and you know people my age certainly are looking at updating their vehicles. Um, might be the last vehicle, hopefully. Um, but uh, yeah, you wanna you wanna consider all these things um, as as and it's easier honestly to do this uh, from that kind of point of view. I think Matt got that across quite well. Um, it will require three quarter votes and approvals for the installations and costs. So you're going to have to sort of investigate that. Um, it says grants are limited there on my side, but it seems to me like there's been an update in the grant program. So that's great. Um, the grants will be available based on an EV ready plan and moving forward with those things that were discussed earlier. And then individual agreements, again, Matt touched on this and permission for installation and alteration to the common electrical system. So if you are going to move and allow an owner to do this, you may still need to get three quarter votes to allow that significant change. And you may still need to get a three quarter vote to allow the significant change to add the charger to a common parking stall area. So you need to know what you're actually allowing in the way of an alteration before you even think about giving an owner that opportunity to put in the charger on their own. Um, because if it's, a, if it's a, a limited common property area that could factor differently uh, compared to a common property parking stall that's assigned by the Strata Corporation, right? So, um, and then the grants are available to individual applications. I think that's important. Uh, so what do you need to know? Again, touched on uh, uh, by Matt, but how is the property designated? the language of your current bylaws, who's conducting the alterations, so whether you're going to do the EV ready plan and go forward, or if you're going to allow these alterations to be done by owners, whether the alteration requires building permits, if it constitutes a significant change in the use of property, like I talked about, um, 
you know, remember that if you're allowing owners to alter property, whether it's a straddle lot, you know, under the standard bylaws, so check your bylaws, standard bylaws say that an owner who's altering their own property um, still has to get approval from council, but the count, council can't unreasonably withhold that um, approval. But if they're, if you're going to be altering common property or limited common property, owner still get, needs to get permission and at the very least take responsibility in writing for that alteration. And strata corporations, we were well advised to put some bylaws in place or rules at the very least if it's common property to actually um, set aside those conditions that Matt talked about, right? Like we talked about this idea that, um, you know, there may be some limitations that you want to put in place so that if the strata adopts this EV ready plan, that there's something already in the alteration agreement that makes that owner either remove the charger or be part of that EV process, the EV update. So you're actually becoming a networked part of the system that the strata is going to be involved in putting in place. Um, um, and then <clears throat> that's the conditions that would be imposed by the corporation prior to granting permission and the applicant would be held responsible for the costs associated. So all costs, and that can include electrical permitting, all the things. So these are would be individual chargers being allowed as part of an alteration agreement. And so everything, even including and up to the um, the the legal advice or the uh, the information you need to get to maybe uh, update and alter your bylaws or put an alteration agreement in place. So owners can be held responsible for these things if they need to, uh, if this needs to be done. Um, again, property designations are are the most important. So you need to you need to know what you are, right? So and and what it is that's being altered. And then uh, how the bylaws or future use allocations is going to affect uh, how strata fees are allocated for extended use of property and things like that. So um, common property and general use, these are the areas of the corporation that are shared. They're designated as the responsibility of the strata to maintain and repair um, building exteriors, interiors, hallways, yards and landscaping, parking and storage facilities. These are all generally common property, but you need a copy of your strata plan. You need to know uh, what kind of easements that might be in place that would maybe prevent you from doing any of these things, um, especially in a commercial residential type strata, often those parkades are shared and there's easements either way. Um, strata Corporation is not permitted to make an owner responsible for the maintenance and repair of common property outright. You can certainly enter into an alteration agreement with an owner who will take responsibility of the costs associated with maintaining and managing. So it stays as limited common property or common property, but the owner who's altered it is responsible for the cost. And the strata can actually do the work. And in that case, charge back the owner. So if there's maintenance or other liabilities, that can happen. And that would be part of the agreement. Um, so it gets complicated quick, right? I mean, so uh, what I would suggest is um, when you're dealing with these things, part of the process when you're dealing your EV ready plan and getting involved in trying to get owners convinced is put some money in your budget for some legal consult on this, right? They're going to be able to, the lawyers are going to be able to review your, your bylaws, review your strata plan, tell you what you are, what's designated and help walk you through this. Um, you know, again, as much as lawyers cost money, sometimes it's really important for you to do this prior to engaging. Now you can do it at the same time. There's nothing, you know, in, in the interest of speed, you can, you can move on with this. And, but I would definitely recommend you need to know this information. So what are you doing? So limited common property is allocated for the exclusive use, for example, of an owner that's typically like your balcony and it can be parking stalls shown on the plan. Um, and uh, the bylaws of the corporation can be amended to define those obligations of owners with respect to the maintenance and repair of limited common property. So if your parking stalls and areas are, are limited common property, you can certainly amend your bylaws then and you can then make an owner responsible for certain things related to that. Um, again, townhouse and garage. And so we've got the word townhouse in here. So that's another bit of a question mark. But um, if my townhouse garage is limited common property, do I need permission to install, this, to install a charging station? And absolutely you do, uh, because the standard bylaws still require an owner who has use of that area to get permission to alter it. Um, and so that's a way of the strata corporation tracking these alteration agreements and making sure that these things are done properly. And those agreements can include the removal of that charger, uh, say when the owner leaves, but certainly that you want to keep, this is a, a selling item. And if you're going to put the infrastructure in place in a townhome, again, uh, seek some legal advice on that. Um, and then the strata can also engage in other 
uh, thing. So what are the boundaries of Stradlot? I don't want to spend too much time on that. Basically, it's just uh, the area not defined as part of a Stradlot is common property. So when you look at a strata plan and you see all the boxes and you see the strata lot one, two, three, four, five, those are the units. And then everything else, even if it's not shown on the plan, is common property. So it'll either be designated, you will see a designation of limited common property or common property. Um, and so this is where we talk about parking stalls often. Um, so again, we're talking about alterations. So this is the individual. Um, the strata can't unreasonably withhold approval for altering a strata lot but certainly can put conditions in place. So you need to know who would be asking for the alteration, what kind of agreements in place. And then you also have commercial leaseholders uh, with a resident with an interest in property may have the authority to apply for alterations, um, but you need to be clear who represents the strata lot. Um, so again, here, documentation is the most important thing to start off with. Um, strata plan, bylaws, technical details of the installation. And this is where that EV ready plan so it dovetails in there, I think and uh, what your electrical pack capacity is, who's performing the installation. And so it looks like, you know, we've got this great package of EV ready planning, which can help you with this. So these questions get answered as part of that. And, but you're gonna be engaging the individuals that are gonna do this. Um, if, you're, if it's an owner that's making the application, then they're gonna have to provide all this information as part of it. So they may have to actually bring in someone and get that letter from the strata before they can do it. Um, and then the critical questions, who's conducting the work? How will it affect the appearance of the building? Will it affect any other owner? Who's responsible for the cost of maintenance? What happens if the owner sells? So in the case of a strata, a normal strata with a parkade, if an owner has been allowed to put it in, do they have to take it out? And that might be the best solution if you're in the short term allowing owners to make these um, additions before you get into the EV ready plan. Um, you may have to make a condition of that is like, Again, you have to remove it when we tell you to or when you move, but the infrastructure stays in place if we're putting it in as a strata. Um, and then is the permit required? And, and I think in almost all cases, you'd say yes to that. Um, and then a condition of granting permission. So we've talked about that. Um, the includes maintenance and repair. So the strata corporation can also uh, create rules around this and the act was or the regulations were amended um, not too long ago and regulation 6.9 now allows the strata corporation to charge fees for things so if it's the strata putting it in and those fees can be fixed or determined on a reasonable basis and they can be based on the rate of consumption the recovery of operating and maintenance costs the number of users and the duration of use so all of those factors can come into place if the strata corporation is managing this and they can set a fee that's based on any of those parameters, as long as you've done something reasonable. And so if the strat is managing this, that's how you can do it. And I understand a lot of these uh, network systems are actually really good at providing information on usage. So that could be helpful. Um, and then uh, what could an owner, so I talked about this a little bit, an owner who's making this application and wants to put their own charger in would have to maybe look at all these different items. So damages caused, environmental costs, waste management removal. These are things that you would consider with almost any alteration. But remember, alterations are required to be approved by the corporation or the council. Um, you need to make sure that you're, if you're a section strata, that you're following the proper uh, process, uh, de defining residential and commercial involvement. And then um, airspace parcels are a whole different animal. And I don't even want to go into that, um, where you have airspace airspace parcels that aren't even part of the strata corporation, but they exist within the boundaries of the strata corporation. Um, and those are bound by contracts. So you're gonna, you're gonna review that with the lawyer before you even think about planning, installing anything like this if you're an airspace parcel. Luckily, uh, most residential commercial are not that, but we're seeing more of them. So, and then I think finally, if you've got an agreement for the corporation, they pay for any costs related to the VSE that was permitted, does this obligation transfer to the new owner? So if you're allowing this to happen and you're allowing them to keep them, um, does your alteration agreement require the new owner to sign off that they're gonna take responsibility for it? So again, these are typical things that we see. And that is it. Thank you so much, Daryl, and thank you so much, Matt and Kevin and Squamish. Very interesting presentations. We had a lot of activity in the Q&A. We can't keep up with your questions. We will get to it right now. I just wanted to 
recap, we have heard about, you know, the advantages of electric vehicles and why we're doing this from um, Ian and Squamish. He's talked about Squamish and Whistler. We have heard um, from Kevin about the rebates. There was a lot of questions maybe that we can get into about who is eligible for the rebates, why and why not. Um, but definitely a big takeaway is that there is a lot of money available right now. Um, and there is a lot of guidance how to get there. And we have summarized much of that too in um, our guide that you find on electriccitysky.ca. The link is right there. Then Matt, thank you so much for giving a lot of um, um, technical advice as uh, you know the, the lens of an electrical expert on, on what the pitfalls are and you know um, what to look out for when going around this. And, and Daryl, thank you so much for giving the strata landscape and making sure that everyone's covered and not just goes out. And um, the more strategic I believe we are, that's what we heard, the more we are prepared um, for fulfilling everyone's needs when it comes to electric vehicle charging. Thank you, Michael, for answering questions in the chat. Um, we have a hand up um, and I think what we probably should be doing for the rest of our time, this webinar goes until 8.30. So we have 30 minutes or 25 minutes for question answers. And I really wanna make sure that we cover all themes and um, cover all questions. So, um, I think what we could be doing now is reading out a couple of questions from the um, Q&A, but also we have a lot of questions from the registration that may not have been covered. And um, if people have their hand up, oh, the hand is down. But if people wanna just raise hand, um, feel free to also ask a question in person that we can lead into a discussion. Um, so, should I kick us off and just read out a couple of questions from the chat? Is that a good, <laughs> I start at the beginning um, and I'll bounce it off to the experts. Or WHA, Whistler, like Whistler Housing Authority units considered townhomes or condos. So um, I would believe that depends on which strata you are living in. So again, that goes into the question who is eligible for the rebates and, and what is considered a MERV. And I, I feel there's still clarification needed. Maybe Kevin, you can you go into that and then maybe we pass it over to Daryl? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not too familiar with what a WHA would be, but basically uh, a MERV is essentially uh, an apartment or a condo. So there's some terminology on our program guide, and I don't know it off the top of my head, but I believe if your property has two to three dwellings, uh, sort of like separated, or not separate, but separate units within one property um, or one building, you would be considered a condo or, or sorry, apartment. And a townhome would be if you have your own individual unit you know it could be separate it's just within a community or or a duplex i guess within a community where it's kind of you have your own sort of garage or, or carport in a way you'd be considered a townhome um i'd want to provide a little bit more detail on that um after sort of reviewing the pro our program guide but you can uh, anyone that's interested in that can also find uh that information on our website in our program guide as well so and that would be under plugin BC. Plugin BC uh, .ca, Yes. Daryl, would you like to add to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, the the reality here is that you. your um, a strata corporation is created when the developer files its documents at land titles, right? So that's whether it's a duplex strata corporation or a townhouse style strata corporation or um, you know, a regular, what we would expect of building a high rise building or even a low rise, right? Those are all things that can be strata corporations, but they, you know, uh, they don't necessarily have to be. So really the, it's about what the program parameters allow, right? Um, if we're just looking at strata corporations in BC, then you just go to the index at 
land titles and find out that this is a strata corporation. Now, whether that qualifies you for a program doesn't necessarily mean that's true, right? Because they've set different parameters for that. So strata corporations generally are, you can tell your strata by just knowing that you've got a strata plan filed at land titles. And we see a lot of people that don't understand that. So you could be living in a, in a duplex. Um, and certainly uh, if there's a strata plan filed at land titles, you are a strata corporation and all the rules and regulations and laws apply, so. Thank you so much for that clarification. Thank you. I'll um, move on to the next question. It would be good to know what the median costs are um, that these rebates, apl rebates apply to. So I, I would assume, you know, if the EV Ready plan has a shift rebate, how much does it actually cost? You know, it's a three thousand um, dollars. How much? How much does it usually cost to do an EV Ready plan? Um. Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, I guess the answer would be is it, it does depend on the size of your building. Um, you know, large high rises that have, you know, over say 200 parking stalls, they could be looking in this maybe $5,000 range, maybe a bit more. Um, if they're sort of, uh, you know, lower, smaller buildings, then they'd be sort of maybe within the three thousand dollar range uh roughly um it also does depend on who you contact as well as they'll sort of have their own market pricing for for their work um but again you are eligible for 75 percent up to three thousand dollars just for the ev ready plan itself that doesn't actually include any work yet and in whistler and soon in Squamish, you also get a thousand dollar top up on these rebates so we really want stratas to start with an EV ready plan. Thank you. Um, is there anyone in Squamish that would be coming on site to do a general assessment to evaluate, to evaluate feasibility of the project after Strata has agreed in principle to it? And I believe the answer is that's the EV ready plan. Um, Correct, yeah, you can, um... Uh, I think that e uh, our EV advisor email has been passed around in the Q&A. Feel free to reach out to us. We can provide sort of a general uh, BC Hydro approved sort of list of contacts, or you have to actually, sorry, uh, request a couple from BC Hydro, um, and they'll be able to come out and look at your property. Um, we have a list as well, or you can do your own due diligence and do your own uh, research on finding an engineering firm or a certified electrician, uh, but they would be the ones to come out and assess your property. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Um, then there is a question around el eligibility for the newer buildings. Um, I think we wanted to clarify that only buildings that have opened up for possession, I assume, after before August 2021 are eligible for um, these rebates. And there is um, one participant who said that his building opened in 2022. Why is he not eligible for rebates? And um, I don't know the reason, but I want to clarify that's the case. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, it If the building um, has a completion date prior to August 31st, 2021, they are eligible for the program. If the completion date is after that date, they're unfortunately ineligible. Um, this is sort of a deadline that was set by the province of BC. Um, one of the main reasons for that deadline is because a lot of bylaws were coming into place that were for municipalities that were requiring any new construction, whether it be commercial or residential, to have some sort of electric vehicle charging infrastructure capacity. So that's why, unfortunately, the uh, some new buildings um, or, or, or some municipalities that have new buildings come up may not unfortunately fit within that category. Um, it's unfortunate, um, but I would make sure you, you check your municipality just make sure are there are there any bylaws kind of going on to see if there is infrastructure that should have been installed or talk to the contractors do your own do a little bit of research just to find out 
Um, but yeah, unfortunately, that is the cutoff date set by the province. Ian, did you want to add to that? Sure. Uh, so in Squamish, we updated our, our zoning bylaw in late 2021 to require all new residences to have at least one energized outlet per unit. I, I apologize to the to the asker of the question. That's just a August. There's a there's a three month window in there, and unfortunately, it sounds like your building hit that sweet spot between the between the two. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to help them out. But hopefully, there's only a very short window of of not eligible and before the before the zoning bylaw update. Thank you so much. Um, one more question. Um, do you think EV charging laws or condo insurances will go in the future, taking into consideration the findings around fires happening while charging? So that's a question about fire safety um, of car batteries and the charging infrastructure. Should we look at outdoor charging instead of in, inside condo parking garages? Uh, I'm, I'm not too familiar with, with the insurance side of things. Um, maybe I can call out Michael to touch on the, the safety of electric vehicle batteries. Um, sure, I mean, I can jump in. I think uh, maybe Daryl kind of um, touched on this as well, uh, talking about, um, yeah, fires and uh, you know, the situation with the, the bolts and, and the conas uh, got a lot of, of play in the media. But uh, keep in mind that out of all of those cars ever made, I think 12, 12 units had, had caught on fire ever. Um, so it is, uh, it is pretty rare. And uh, the newer, newer vehicles um, do get quite a lot of you know, thermal battery management and, and protection. So, um, you know, I've uh, you know, lived in, in condos and apartments and there's been electric vehicles there. And I've had to move because of multiple fires, and they're all from people doing something silly in their kitchen. Um, so <laughs> it's not something that would, you know, affect my decisions uh, in a MERB. If I Thank may, you. I think I think the the most important thing is as we evolve into this uh, electrified system in BC is that strata corporations and strata managers are gonna to want to have uh, consult, consult with their insurers. So just talk to your brokers, right? And if they have any concerns, I'm certain they're gonna add it into your policy, so. That's a good point. Yeah, Matt. Um, I would just uh, point out that uh, again, uh, in the grand scheme of things, the percentages of those uh, issues have been pretty small. Um, going through a proper permitting process, uh, all of this equipment is certified, um, and in a lot of the installations inside, there are redundant sprinkler systems and parkades. Uh, it's concrete, non-combustible construction. Uh, so, in a general sense, of course, you want to pay attention to safety, but it really, in my view, should not be a barrier to uh, adoption at this stage. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Next question. Um, for a multi-unit residential building, is a plan required for anything that needs to go into supporting a site alteration permit? Have an apartment building that has the unbuilt parking spaces on the strata plan, and as was the old land use contract, whew, is the best location for us um, for multiple shared stall in for multiple shared stall install, as is adjacent to a BC hydro transformer pad and the building to have a minimal infrastructure built to install the churches. I apologize, I did not understand the full question. I feel this is a very technical question and I think for the answer, it would be ideal to maybe launch the EV ready plan process and really speak to a electrical or installation professional about these technical questions. Um, did Matt probably understand the questions? <laughs> um, admittedly, it was it was it was tricky to follow. It, it, it was a bit of a mouthful. I believe the essence of it was: it, uh, is it better to be closer to the available infrastructure where you plan your site? And unquestionably, yes, it is. Uh, be that within the building, 
or be that with on the on the property outside uh, the, the closer you can get uh, to um, your utilities uh, power supply or your own buildings power supply uh, will definitely cut down on electric electrical infrastructure costs labor and often uh, civil works fantastic thank you matt you understood <laughs> Anyone want to add to that? I'll move on to the next question. What charges can be charged to users? Loss of income if rental parking space is used for communal space. Is there a charge for the connectivity? Can this be charged to the users? Um, maintenance contracts. And I think this is all around, like, can this be charged? Um, is this all around like cost sharing agreements and you know really the cost to everyone of having the charger installed and um i again would say there's no simple answer but i leave it to the experts i would say an ev ready plan will give you provide you certain models and costing solutions for your models but maybe anyone wants to add to that matt <laughs> yeah Absolutely. Um, with, with most network stations, there will be some uh, fees uh, through uh, a provider of some kind to monitor energy use. I believe that we still technically can't charge for power, um, but you can charge for time and um, and, uh, and 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 having um, that facility available to you. So that's really up to the strata to distract to decide on a pricing structure. Uh, if you're looking to recoup costs of the installation, then you know you just you just you just need to work that out amongst yourselves. But everything will be tracked, um, and and you and it's up to you to decide you know how you want to charge it. And you can have individual pricing for individuals. So you, as somebody who comes in as a visitor, they could be charging much more per hour uh, versus uh, a resident who maybe even put in money towards the towards uh, the installation. So there's there's many options there to track that. And, and make sure all costs are covered off and, and potentially recouped. Yeah, and I assume there's many models like the public chargers around charging different rates at different times and, and charging models there. Daryl, did you want to add to that? You came off mute. Yeah, I think uh, you know that falls back on that regulation that was changed 6.9. So I think what people want to do is that are involved in this is just look up Reg 6.9, and you'll see that the Strata can pass these rules and uh, and bylaws related to the rate, the use, and uh, duration, and number of users. So there's different ways that the regulations have now been updated to allow that kind of flexibility for recovery of expenses. Thank you so much. Okay. Who, the next question, who owns the EV charger in the limited common property, the parking stall? Who is responsible for the maintenance? I again think it depends on your unique strata situation and model you choose to go for. And the first step would be the EV ready plan to understand that, but I leave it to the experts to elaborate. Uh, I, I would just say it's 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 up to the strata and the residents whether the strata purchases the chargers then it would be they would be the owners and they would be responsible for the maintenance if the resident decides to purchase the charger then the same uh, would apply they'd be responsible for the maintenance uh, the networking cost though uh, associated with the level two chargers does sort of if any maintenance you know is required is usually covered within that sort of monthly fee or, or subscription maybe we can call it so thank you thank you for the answer yeah can you comment on the various players out there like electrum flow um is there a risk to be locked into a given eb management system it's a great question matt <laughs> please go ahead uh, uh, kevin uh, i are you, did you want to speak to that? Uh, I was, I'm here interested to hear what you have to say. I was going to say, I don't think there's a risk or anything uh, to being locked in, not at all. But I also don't work uh, too much within the field of the chargers. So be interested to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I mean, I would say at this stage, uh, if you're looking for a full EV ready plan adoption strategy, you're going to want to go with one provider. And just for clarity to step back, uh, Electrum is an electrical contracting company and Flow uh, is an EV 
uh, EVIC, electric vehicle service equipment provider, a charger provider. So they're not, they're not quite the same, uh, but they do work together. Um, <clears throat> but one, one of the issues that I touched on after my long-winded speech, apologies for that, uh, is emerging technologies. And one particular area of interest to many people out there is something called open charge point protocol. And these are systems that allow for uh, electric vehicle charging where you have different manufacturers within one system. So not one single proprietary system working within the framework of, uh, of that strata. The, 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 the trouble with that emerging technology is it's an emerging technology and it's not proven yet. And most of the experts out there right now, we just actually finished a project uh, working directly with BCIT and some leading engineering firms. Uh, uh, and there can be quite a few glitches. Um, it's just, it's all getting worked out, but it's very likely that that will be a very common and robust system in a few years after going through some trials. But for now, if you're looking to move immediately, your best bet probably is to stick to, to one vendor and you need to be very careful what that vendor can provide in the context of an energy management system, which will be critical for most, uh, for most uh, MERV installations. Fantastic, thank you. And so from the Stratus perspective, simply taking that uh, cost and budgeting in your annual budget for that is simple, right? So. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. In a strata where the electrical system is at maximum capacity, will BC Hydro allow two PMT on one legal title? What is a PMT? <laughs> Uh, a PMT is a pad mount transformer. Um, in certain situations, and BC Hydro now has changed the rules where they, they're doing what, they, what you call multiple drops. Um, but typically, they are not allowing that with uh, PMT installations. However, when engaged with BC Hydro, you will be going through a design process and, um, and touching back on, 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 on some of the uh, supply, chain, uh, supply chain constraints, I'll just throw out there that even if you are not ready to move forward with an EV ready plan, but you think you might be, it could be worth engaging with BC Hydro now uh, or your utility provider uh, because their whole process can take uh, some, some significant time as well. Um, and and, and you, you really need to get ahead of that. When you get into the design process to decide what they can bring in for you, um, there is a cost and a fee associated with that. I don't want to give out any numbers, but typically speaking on, on, on the scale of a, of, a, of a larger strata, let's just say maybe five to 10 grand for, uh, for a design from your util utility provider could really save you a lot of money if you're well positioned again to take advantage of that, of that uh, incentive when the time comes. So you might consider doing that even prior to uh, engaging uh, with an EV ready plan provider. Mm, that's very good advice. Thank you, Matt. I had no idea. Um, another question around cost. Um, what just more or less is the approximate project cost for, let's say, 80 stalls in a parkade? Just to sort of give a give an order of magnitude idea what we're talking here. Uh, hard to say, but to give you a rough ballpark. So if you go the EV ready route and doing everything in sort of a large sum, significantly cheaper, um, including the charger, you're probably looking at roughly around maybe $3,200 per stall. So you can sort of ex extrapolate from that. The other rebate stream I talked about was a standalone charger. So that's just a handful of individuals getting a charger installed um, within the building. That is significantly more expensive, unfortunately, just because um, it's just, it's kind of putting a Band-Aid on a small solution. Um, and you're probably looking roughly, including the charger again, maybe around $6,000 per stall. So we definitely recommend the EV Ready route. One proactive approach to EV charging and significantly cheaper. And a follow-up question on that one is, what's the timeline for a project like that? I think it would depend, Matt. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, well, just to, to touch back on the previous question, um, 
the costs really do depend depend on the existing infrastructure that you have on in, in place and and how you can build out from there. Uh, and then another key to that is uh, how many chargers you're going to have on one circuit. So like what your what your energy management system can do with that. So you, you generally speaking, uh, for the most robust charging recovery times, you want to have a maximum of uh, a, a four to one power share on a, on a charger. Of course, there are other systems that can look at that a little bit differently that are a little bit more robust, but you got to be careful about the manufacturer there. But I would say overall, uh, the numbers that you, you that you provided there, 6,000 per stall uh, being a robust budget number and two to two, two to 3,000 given the right circumstances is also a good number to work with uh, for the initial um, planning phases. Again, now in terms of how long it takes, that depends on what kind of infrastructure you have in place uh, and whether, what other entities that you need to bring into the conversation. So are you doing a, an electrical service upgrade? That could add six months to a, to a year and a half, depending on your situation. If you don't have that, then it's really uh, often boils down to um, how quickly the strata can move. Um, and then, you know, generally speaking, the incentive program process is, uh, I would say, a lot less challenging than it kind of feels on the front end. Um, so, you know, it could be anywhere from, I would say, a, a six months to two years. Thank you. Um... We have six minutes left. Um, I'm going to wrap it up with the last two or three questions. We have a good, um, let's say, case study here from Richard, who, who says who lives in, in, in a strata where the EV ownership grew by five times in the, in the last um, three years. And they went through the process of evaluating designing EV ready installation, but it was turned down at the AGM. Would it be feasible to allow in, an individual unit to install a charger in their parkade um, that would then be connected to their own meter in a high rise? So the AGM at the AGM, the strata said, no, can he go like his own route? <laughs> Matt? Matt, yeah. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No. Kevin, please. No, I, was gonna, I mean, uh, I was going to say, if you do get approval from your strata to go ahead and do that, you could do the standalone charger route. But if you don't get approval, then then unfortunately not. So. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, it really all depends on how you organize yourselves and, and honestly what your community is like. Uh, that being said, on an implementation side, uh, jumping into the meter stack and, and, and getting it out to your stall, I've seen it. I've seen it before. There are technically some challenges uh, involved with that, and you would absolutely need to make sure that your electrical contractor is uh, discussing that uh, with the inspection authority. Um, it can be done, uh, but that is a tricky process. Thank you. Um, I want to answer them all. So two more. Oh. I'm getting stressed. No, I'm kidding. Um, I live in a 30 year old building with a lot of older owners who don't have EVs and don't want to. Um, would sort of a small installation be possible where it's just a couple of EV chargers and pay as you go model? Is that a model that's feasible? Yeah, you could if I mean, we as, as I said before, we do recommend the EV ready bot. EV ready route. However, sometimes it's just not feasible um, based off of different scenarios. So you could go the standalone um, charger route and get, you know, a handful of chargers installed. There are rebates available for that. It'd be the same process of having, you know, a technical assessment done by an electrical contractor to come out and have a look at the property. So Awesome. Okay, that's an option. What's the lifetime of a charging station? So when would they need to be replaced? Um, that's a matter of use. Um, I'm sure, uh, you know, Daryl could, could speak to, uh, how common property can be treated a little roughly. Um, that's really just up to, up to the users. Uh, there are some, uh, manufacturers out there that have a focus on uh, a robust design more than others. 
Um, sometimes uh, a focus on a robust design means that uh, there's another area where maybe they're not as strong as, a, as, a, as another unit. You really just want to know what's best for your situation, understand how you need to track things or, or deal with your cells within the strata, and then find somebody who can explain the differences to you and, 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 and make a, make a rec recommendation from there. Awesome. So with two minutes to go, um, I will wrap it up here. There's still a couple of questions out there, um, but I would say we have our guide. Most of the information can be found in our guide that is available on electricseedasky.ca for download. Also, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, you'll find our contacts. Um, um, where do you find our contacts? Well, we have Plugin BC that's always available for outreach, um, um, or Emotive, or or Choa. Um, so please feel free to reach out. Um, and again, the link to our guide is in the chat right now, and um, we have also a lot of contacts in there. So mine and Ian contact, Ian's contacts are in there and we are happy to refer you out to other experts. Um, I'll wrap it up with that. Thank you so much everyone for participating. Um, we hope we could clarify a couple of um, aspects and if there's still open questions, please um, reach out to us and read the guide on electricseedasky.ca. This meeting was recorded and we will share the link for the recording also as soon as it's available in the next couple of days at um, electricseedasky.ca where you can share the link to the recording or watch it again and have access to a lot of good resources when it comes to EV charger installation in apartments and condos. And with that, I say goodbye and have a great night. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>